Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mac Talks. My name is Paul O'Byrne. I am the Dean of the Michael G. De Groot School of Medicine and the Vice President for the Faculty of Health Sciences at McMaster University. This is the second in a series of conversations with McMaster University researchers who are at the forefront of tackling some of the world's most pressing challenges. We are delighted to welcome the award-winning journalist and author, Marin McKenna, who will be moderating this evening's conversation about preventing the next pandemic. Marin is a senior fellow uh, for the Center of the Study of Human Health at Emory University, where she teaches health and science writing and storytelling and media literacy. Her TED talk, What Do We Do When Antibiotics Don't Work Anymore, has been viewed more than 1.8 million times and translated into 34 languages. She is the author of the bestseller, Big Chicken, The Incredible Story of How Antibiotics Created Modern uh, Agriculture and Changed the Way the World Eats, and the award-winning magazine piece, The Plague Years in New Republic. Marin also runs a massive open online course, Journalism in a Pandemic, covering COVID-19 now and in the future, supported by the Knight Foundation, the United Nations Development Program, UNESCO, and the World Health Organization. Marin will be talking with McMaster University's Dr. Jerry Wright, a global expert in antibiotic resistance and the inaugural lead of our newly launched Global Nexus for Pandemic and Biological Threats. Jerry is the Scientific Director of the Michael G. De Groot Institute for Infectious Disease Research and the David Braley Center for Antibiotic Discovery. He is a professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Biomedical Sciences, holds the Michael G. De Groot Chair in Infectious and Anti-Infective Research, and holds a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Antibiotic Biochemistry. Jerry is also a co-founder of the Canadian Anti-Infective Innovation Network, dedicated to leveraging innovative approaches to solve the expanding health crisis caused by antimicrobial resistance and subsequent infections. Now, please join with me as we listen to Marilyn and Jerry in conversation about preventing the next pandemic. Jerry, it's such a pleasure to join you in this chat about where we find ourselves in this present moment. Thanks for taking the time and thanks for inviting me. It's great to see you and thanks for doing this for us. I really appreciate it. So we are now in the ninth month of this pandemic. So I think we should start by kind of taking stock of the present moment. Can you sum up for us your feelings about where we are now? Yeah, so I think, you know, this has been on a, a roller coaster, right, for everybody. Um, and it's been really interesting from a scientific perspective. Um, it's the, really the first pandemic where we've been able to bring to bear some of the most um, sophisticated molecular biological tools and epidemiological tools to address a global concern. You know, we, we were able to isolate the virus incredibly quickly. Um, but if you want to calibrate to HIV, for example, from back in the early 80s, it took a couple of years before we even knew what the causative agent is. You know, we knew what the virus was within weeks or months, depending on when it actually emerged. You know, was, was it December or November? Um, we sequenced the genome right away. We got that information out to the world, right? Again, on the, just a remarkable event. And then... That launched um, all the vaccine um, strategies that we have now. There's almost 50 around the world. Uh, it launched a whole bunch of drug discovery opportunities in incredibly short time. Um, so in many ways, this has been a scientific tour de force. Um, and considering the compressed timelines where we're at, um, at the same time, it's been devastating. <laughs> Right for everyone. I mean, through, we're gonna we're uh, probably a million deaths around the world. Probably maybe um, 
maybe even by the time that this is this is broadcast, um, five thousand people a day are dying from this infection that never existed, you know, a year ago for in our in our world. Um, I mean, five thousand people a day is is an enormous number of people. I mean, it's if you put it into perspective, and uh, you know, it's a it's a trope to do this, but it's the equivalent of twelve to thirteen. Sevens dropping out of the sky every day, every day. Here in the United so, States, we just uh, commemorated the 19th anniversary of the 9/11 attacks. Right. Five thousand people a day is more than everyone who died on right. 9/11, which was for us an incredible national tragedy. So I really appreciate the way that you're drawing the sort of the that I don't know if they're converging or diverging lines of this pandemic. That on the one hand, it's it represents extraordinary scientific achievement in response, but on the other hand, it's this massive global tragedy. Can we go back to the earliest days of this, which for me was just after, just before midnight on the day before New Year's Eve last year, when the international list ProMed published their first notice that they'd heard some rumblings of a cluster of pneumonia in uh, Wuhan in China. Do you remember what your first moment of concern was? And do you have any sense at this point of how disquieted you were when you heard whatever your first rumblings were? Yeah, so I was doing other things on New Year's Eve, so I wasn't, I didn't catch catch that um, that announcement because it, it obviously flew under the wires. I think in the first couple of weeks of January when um, news organizations started picking up on the, the outbreak that was happening in Wuhan, um, and, um, and even then I, I must confess, I was like, well, that's, you know, that's not unusual for, the, uh, that we were, there's some, there's an outbreak of some disease. I didn't, I didn't at the time think it was going to be anything brand new. Um, and, um, but as things progressed, as we saw the, the images of the, um, uh, makeshift hospitals and parking lots and the lockdown on the city. I mean, that's when things really started for me to trigger that this is, this is a really unusual event. This is not something that happens uh, on a regular basis. And, um, but I still wasn't, I must confess, I didn't see this. I didn't see where we're at today. Back then, you know, we took a family vacation when, in the Caribbean in the, in the, at the beginning of February, it's cold in Canada. We try to get, try to get away. Um, and during there, I was getting phone calls, you know, should we close the borders? Should we, uh, and I was scratching my head to try and understand what was happening. It wasn't, it wasn't until I sort of put the, you know, the outbreaks that was happening at the epidemic in, in Iran, the outbreak in Seattle, and then down in, um, down into um, uh, San Francisco and up into Vancouver that I really started to realize that this is, this is one of the events that we that we talk about as infectious disease uh, scientists. You know, there's always going to be a pandemic. The big one is coming, uh, or a big one is coming, and we can pretty much predict it. But the scale and the rapidity of of the um, of the spread of of this, because of modern transportation, because of of the way that the virus behaves through you know through uh, airborne through air um, uh, transmission, that was. Uh, that's when I really started to realize, and I think all of us became to came to to understand that this is this is something really out of the ordinary, and that we're going to need to to take serious talk about how we address it. So that's a great moment for me to ask you: What did you person you personally, but you, your lab, your center, what what did you do to pivot toward this? Coronavirus wasn't one of your organisms beforehand, was it? No, my personal research is in bacteria and fungi for the most part. I look at, I'm trying not to understand another pandemic that's happening. Actually, it's, it's a slower moving one, but it's, it's antibiotic resistance. Um, no, so this was, um, this was an opportunity uh, to actually take full advantage of what we had tried to build at, at McMaster over the last 15 years. I mean, we, we were able to, to, um, so you and I both know that infectious disease research is not one of the most sexy and well-funded areas of research um, uh, out there. Shocking, but um, true. <laughs> no, it's, uh, and it's, honestly, it's because we've been so successful in putting a lid on it, right? If you think about a um, hundred years ago, 
right? The average life expectancy in Canada was something like 58, and, uh, and now it's well over 80. Uh, and the, those, those extra years and that extra um, connections with our families and all the things that we're doing is a really the result of infection control because infections went from, you know, almost half of what killed people to less than 5%. Um, so it's understandable that infectious disease research is is not you know wasn't top of mind even though we knew as experts in this in this area that we were going to have this but we were able to convince some incredibly generous philanthropists um, first mr. de Groot and then it was amplified tremendously by the Boris family and then the and David Braley over the last uh, several years to establish an infectious disease group at McMaster that was really multidisciplinary. So we have virologists and we have mathematicians and modelers and we have epidemiologists and chemists and um, biochemists all working together. And so when this emerged, even though this coronavirus research was not on anyone's radar, we were looking, our virologists were, have research programs in influenza and then um, in HIV and, and, um, and other areas, but not coronavirus. In fact, there's probably three people in Canada that were working on coronaviruses. You just couldn't get money for, for working on it. And that's what, that's what makes this business work, right? Um, but you but had, to... so in, in your, what you're telling me, though, is that you had people who were experts in the last few pandemics, right? In HIV, in influenza, even if there was not someone there who was working on coronavirus. So, that's so. How then did you, once you saw the scale of this unfolding disaster, what was the particular contribution that you thought your centers could make? Well, we, we were very fortunate uh, in a couple of ways. One is, is that the federal government in Canada had announced um, research money to work on this area very quickly, and they turned that around very fast. And so a group of us started working on drug discovery, because that's something that we are really good at at, at McMaster, preclinical drug discovery. Um, we had um, another group working on genomics, primarily focused on the, the genomics of antibiotic resistance and pathogens, but they immediately pivoted towards the G facilities and, and drug discovery facilities that were instantly turned around to work exclusively on that. Uh, our vice president of research, Karen Mossman's uh, team, um, including a postdoc, Aaron J. Banerjee, uh, who was seconded to um, clinical group in Toronto to get the first human samples that came to Canada, were able to isolate the virus very, very quickly and bring it to Mac. And this is what we've been working on ever since. So we're, you know, it's really one of those opportunities that many of us could contribute. Um, our um, modeling team, the mathematicians immediately got to work to think about how do we deal with the curve, this whole business of flattening the curve and things like that. It's all comes from modeling, thinking ahead. How does this, uh, based on what we know, how diseases work, how do we, how do we control and dampen this? And our epidemiologists, of course, went to, to work very quickly to try and assemble as much data as possible, not just in Canada, because we're relatively fortunate with the exception of just some tragic uh, outbreaks in long-term care facilities um, that within the population as a whole, it was, the infection rate was, was pretty low. So it really was a matter of all hands on deck, right? This is our mm -hmm. opportunity to do something. This is why we wanted to come together as a group. Um, and it's been great. We've been able to, for even in, um, one of the things that came out was that everyone wanted to help, including small businesses who had, everyone had a, something that they wanted to contribute, whether it was mask sterilization, because we had this PPE shortage, or whether it was new drug development, and so we turned our labs into, into um, uh, test labs for the private sector as well. And we continue to do that um, to this day. So it was really um, an opportunity, I think, to show that what we built could be put to use very quickly. So since you're the one that I've got on camera, I want to ask a bit more about what you specifically, your lab, your group was doing. Can you talk a bit about how the, this drug discovery process happens, how you pivot to, especially if you've been working on bacteria and fungi and uh, antibiotic resistance, how do you pivot to looking for compounds for a completely different organism? Yeah, so that, again, we're, we're, we were really 
but we really benefited from the communication of scientists uh, around the world, from China, who did the original sequencing of of the uh, of the virus, from others uh, who were able to we were able to quickly identify which proteins we thought would be uh, important to get the virus replicating in a cell, get it into the cell. So those were identified very quickly. Uh, um, and then it's just a matter of moving those out of the virus. It's not hard to do these days. You can just stitch things together um, using uh, recombinant DNA technology. You don't even have to worry about the virus. We were able to build those proteins in our labs and start screening them against our and by screen, what does that mean? That means uh, in a high throughput fashion, we expose them to literally hundreds of thousands of compounds that we've collected over the years. Mm -hmm. And we look for things that alter the activity of those proteins. And those may have, acti it may have an opportunity to disrupt the viral replication. So while we're doing that in parallel, our team of virologists led by Matt Miller was in the biosafety level three lab, all suited up, in establishing the viral assays that we needed to test our compounds on those those viruses and very and incredibly rapidly you know within weeks we were able to do our first tests on um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, in our own facility based on hit what we call hits compounds that look like they're gonna like they might have an effect you know in the lab through on through all these robotics that we have on the actual virus in in the, in the lab. So, you know, what normally would have taken, you know, months to do, we put together in, in weeks. How's and it going so, so far? Yeah. Drug discovery is hard. <laughs> it's one of the first, it's the first, I teach a course in drug discovery uh, every couple of years. And the, it's like the first thing that I say is that drug discovery is hard. You know, we always hear that it takes 10 years to get a drug from through the process. And, um, and it's, it's challenging. Um, it's one of the reasons, for example, that, that not just us, but the pharmaceutical industry is, is, is seeking to repurpose. So look at existing drugs and see if they have any effect. And that's how remdesivir that we've all heard of, which was originally established as a, as an anti-Ebola drug, uh, came to, um, came out so quickly because it, it was on the shelf ready to go. Um, it's not a, magic bullet and so we still need to work really hard to find other drugs um but uh we do have some leads and we're we're and we're finishing up on or we're uh, following up on them one of the other things that we've had uh really the great benefit of is embedding chemists into our group medicinal chemists and so those folks are able to take our hits now and work on them really hard to try and change them and make them better um it's a process you know and it's taking some time, but um, but we're making we're making good progress. But no uh, no magic bullet yet, unfortunately. It'd be a great place to announce it. Excellent. So one of the things that really strikes me in what you've been saying is how much of a just crashing emergency this has been. And that's not just true for you, right? That's true for every lab, every aspect of society all around the world in response to this pandemic. And uh, you know, I, I think we would like to get to a place globally where we are not always taken by surprise by these emergencies. And you mentioned that remdesivir was stood up against Ebola before the 2014 Ebola outbreak. We really didn't have the excellent therapeutics for that. And we came out of that with a vaccine as well. So um, the last time you and I spoke, you told me that uh, McMaster was going to start to look at doing this differently, looking ahead at the possibility of global pandemics and trying to anticipate instead of always being behind the curve. So is there something that you can say about that at this point? Have you gotten beyond that initial idea? Yeah, it's, I'm incredibly excited about this, this opportunity. So we have a code name for this idea at McMaster called Nexus, which is a, a merging, you know, a, a meeting place. Um, and so the idea of Netflix at, at a very high level right now is to take what we have, the example of the, the Groot Institute of Infectious Disease Research that has this multidisciplinary team and this ability to pivot quickly um, and then extend it out to uh, other areas that we know are important. So a lot of people are, a lot of people are, are saying, you know, they can't wait to get back to the way things were. 
But I think what we have to do is, is at least in our field, is not go back to the way things were. If we have to use this as a learning um, opportunity to say that the way that things were did not work. We're still stuck in this, you know, uh, the, uh, the Churchill quote is that this is not the end, uh, uh, or how does it go? Something like this is this is this not, is not the, the end, the end. this is and not this, even the beginning of the end the beginning this be that's the end right the beginning yeah thank you uh this is i think where we're at um and and certainly what we've seen is that governments are slow governments are slow on purpose because they are layered in bureaucracy that are that is there to protect the taxpayers money and the safety of people um so governments are slow they're great at certain things but they're slow um academic institutions are often paralyzed by silos where engineers don't talk to clinicians and social scientists don't know uh, a biologist because we have our own little areas of expertise. We don't even know how to talk to each other. Coronavirus uh, uh, virologists probably don't have the same language as HIV virologists do, right? And so one of the things that, that we've realized, you know, and by example, living through the degree, um, Infectious Disease Institute example over the years is that opportunities to break those silos give you tremendous flexibility in the ability to do things that otherwise we couldn't do. And so the idea now is to take this, uh, this idea that we've, or this, this example of the Institute and, you know, to use my uh, spinal tap analogy, take it to 11, that to, to not only do we want to include the groups that we've already connected with, but, but certainly what the virus has shown, for example, is that infectious diseases impact society in many ways. The economy is a shambles, right, across the globe. The, the um, trade flow has been interrupted. We don't know, we couldn't get PPE for the longest time, and that might be happening again soon because we, as we in the Northern Hemisphere, see their curves, unfortunately, going up, even here in Ontario. Um, we have this rampant, completely unexpected, in my, to, cause perhaps because I'm naive, attack on expertise, right? Where everyone is an expert, um, except for the experts. <laughs> and so that's, a, that's an element of, of sociology and of, of that it can, or in humanity that needs to be tackled in a, in a way or understood because one of the things that, that scientists, biologists, clinicians can do is come up with solutions if the solutions will not be accepted by the populace at large, then, then why are we doing this? We have to think about all of these things, international law, education, and public education in particular is something that obviously the year is near and dear to your heart. How do, we, how do we get more people to understand the process of science, the importance of infection, and, and the, the buy-in for solutions as, as we go forward? So I think all of these things become part of the mix. And in, in a, an infectious disease institute going forward that doesn't think about that, a university that doesn't think about things in a, with you know, much broader peripheral vision than just the narrow, I need to solve my specific molecular target, I think is missing an opportunity and missing a way to be prepared for the next pandemics. And there's going to be some, as we all know. So... That, I think, is a fantastic proceed of sort of where we are now and where society went wrong in failing to respond to this. But what I want to hear is how this is actually going to work for you. So are you, are you setting up a, a group or a, some sort of like have a trail across silos where someone is watching the global data and bringing it over to your modelers or to your drug discoverers? Or how will this work day to day? So I think it, it, there's a lot of layers to this onion <laughs> and we're still working out how it's, how, how we're going to put it together. And I'm, and I, we're looking to get the um, partners in a many, cause we can't do this alone. You know, McMaster university is small. We need to, to partner with a number of people. We're good at certain things. We're not good at others, but I can imagine this is the, I have a dream. I can imagine a, a location, a new building that would bring, mathematicians, chemists, um, social scientists, humanists together who have interest in this area 
um, working all together, having coffee together, um, uh, going to the same seminars. Um, at the same time as having um, opportunities for people around the world with expertise in these areas, journalists who could come in and, and explain to us how we're not communicating properly to get the information out. Um, I accept. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely top of my list. Um, humanists who are studying uh, the history of pandemics, for example, their history of outbreaks or vaccine denialism or whatever, um, whatever we think is, is, is appropriate, as well as connections to the private sector, mm -hmm. connections to government, public health. Um, and, and those could be secondments where these folks come in. We've had tremendous success in, in bringing public health um, researchers from the federal government into, into, the, uh, into the academy and then have this exchange of ideas, you know, because the, what's important to someone working on um, foodborne disease uh, and at the government level is informed by the fundamental research that happens every day, cutting edge research that happens every day in academia. And this, this is an important um, connection to be made. And we've had success in this area before. So, you know, if I think where, what does it look like? Like five years from now, we have a hub of, of researchers to do this extra capacity. One of the things we've realized in our case is that, um, you know, we build laboratories for what we can afford today. <laughs> so our level three facility, for example, um, was built for the, for the research programs of the day 10 years ago. Um, we are bursting at the seams right now um, because we have, uh, we now have not only those projects, but we have these extra projects. Um, the same thing goes with, with wet labs. The same thing goes with, with offices. So there needs to be this ability to expand and contract uh, as projects do, and then to be able to, to move things along in a, in a very um, nimble way. Again, this is the thing that I, I think, I, had we not had the investments by Mr. Groot in 2007 to build this institute, we would not be having this conversation because we would not have been able to do everything. You know, for the first month, the DeGroote Institute was funding all of the, the uh, genome sequencing of the virus in the province of Ontario Oof. because it took so long for the things to move themselves down through, through, the, uh, through the food chains, right? So it's, it's easy for us to make a decision quickly, very hard for others. So that, I think that's, that's part of the, the whole plan. So I think this, this point that you're making about um, because of its funding structure, science inevitably has to plan for what is in front of it or what is imminently coming, but has a lot of difficulty creating flexibility for the things that we cannot imagine for the unknown unknowns um, is, is uh, something that completely shifts the frame for me. So thank you for that. I, I know we promised uh, the audience that we would only be speaking for 25 minutes and we are creeping up on that. So I wanna give you just one minute <laughs> See if you can take one minute and it, just whatever final statement you would like to make some something about that something that you want people to take away from this conversation about the the unique importance of this moment in this global crisis. Yeah, so I think this is one a once in a sort of generation opportunity to recalibrate where we're going and and how we understand infection. Again, you know, we're so used to controlling infectious diseases. We've been so fortunate with vaccines. We've been so fortunate with antibiotics, antiviral agents, that we've taken all of that for granted. Um, but there's, those of us who know understand that, that things like the current um, pandemic are always going to happen. We're always going to be facing something coming up because it's just the way it works but also the, the, what underlays all of our success, it has been antibiotics and vaccines and, and excellent investment in public health, and that's eroding. And so not only do we have to plan for what's gonna happen, we have to shore up what's underneath our success so far. And things like antibiotic resistance, for example, things like investment in public health um, need to happen um, now and this is our opportunity to to do it because we're living the effects of not having control over infection and it's not good right so if one thing we can take away from all of this infectious diseases are 
bad <laughs> and they have massive effects on society. Uh, and, but we can get around, we can get on top of them. We just have to plan ahead and we have to invest. I could not agree more. Thank you so, so much. And thanks for this unique glimpse into the inner workings of your institute and your center and the university and its response to coronavirus, to this crisis that that virus has plunged the world into. So now we're going to turn from you and I talking to each other to entertaining questions from the audience who have been listening patiently. So we're going to wrap this up and I'm going to check for what the first questions are. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, this segment just now, uh, the conversation between myself, Marin McKenna, and Dr. Jerry Wright. So you can probably tell by the slight differences in the color of the light where we are that we pre recorded that just in case there were any kind of technical difficulties. But we're really live with you now. And we have a lot of questions to consider that have come in from the audience. Thanks for being so attentive. So, Jerry, good evening. Um, a member of the audience would like to know, given global, global technology, uh, global science, surveillance systems, how is it that we failed to recognize that COVID-19 was coming? What could we have done differently? So it's a, that's a great question. And, and, and actually we've been really benefited over the last several years with these, these global networks and, 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 um, and uh, alert systems that are connected with each other to be able to identify when little outbreaks are happening and, and when are, are right around the world and when we can uh, we could be alerted to them. Um, they tend to be not the sexiest thing in all of public health and there's been a lot of, uh, of difficulties getting them funded and getting the conduct the information that they are providing to the front lines. I think there was a failure in that uh, uh, certainly in this case, hoping that we've learned from that and we'll be able to move forward. Um, but the reality is, is that even though we're so connected, the world is very big, right? And again, I think it's important to remember just how quickly we've come to, to deal with this. I mean, a year ago, we didn't even know that this, this virus and this disease even existed. So it's, it felt really slow and it could have been better, um, but things are improving. and 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 it's really fast on the scale of other things that we have, we have held, had to, to deal with. And now I think just like um, in other diseases where we have a sense that, the, that, that there could be future outbreaks, Ebola, for example, there, there's gonna be a lot more boots on the ground where we're gonna be able to pay attention to respiratory viruses like this as they come through, hopefully. So it's interesting to me when I look back, you know, it, it, it took, I don't know, a, a month or so in 2003 for the, the original SARS virus to be identified. The, the sequence of this one was actually announced in what, a week or 10 days after yeah. the Wuhan Department of Virology or the, the Public Health Department uh, announced that they had a pneumonia cluster, told the rest of the world. So the problem may not have been the viral characterization as much as the, the, the rest of the public health response. It is, and that's the rest of the public health response globally. Is there anything you can say about how we improve that? Yeah, I think so. One of the, th one of the things that we're actually really good at is the, is the biology molecular elements of this. That happened incredibly quickly. The virology, the isolating the virus, sequencing the virus, getting that information out in lightning speed when you think about how these things actually work. Technically, isolating the virus is not easy. Right, this is a challenging thing to do. So we're really impressed by that. Where we are obviously, and this in COVID-19 has really exposed the weak underbelly of public health. This is, you know, chronically underfunded. You're, you know, uh, part of med of uh, healthcare. It's usually the realm of governments, um, some of whom, you know, have problems within borders to talk to each other, let alone outside of borders. We sign a lot of agreements with a lot of good intentions. We don't back it up with any money. Um, it's a, and, and as consequently, it's hard to get people who want to work in this field because, you know, where, where are the opportunities? So this is a, a real um, reckoning for, for public health. And I think it's, and it's not the fault of the public health providers. It's really the fault of, of 
societies around the world who have failed to invest in this. It's like insurance, right? Like if you if you don't pay your insurance and then your car wrecks, well then nothing good's gonna come gonna come of that. I mean, and no one wants to pay insurance because you're betting against yourself, right? And the same thing with, with public health to a large extent. You're betting against that you're something bad is going to happen. But something bad is going to happen. We know this. Um, and, and whether it's something as globally impactful as, as a pandemic like we're, like we're living through now, or whether it's a little salmonella outbreak um, you know, in, in a nursing home, these are important parts of the public health um, continuum that we have to invest in. Otherwise, we're going to have continuing problems all the time. So uh, someone I was uh, interviewing for a story said to me, I think yesterday, you know, that this is the paradox of prevention, that if prevention works well, then nothing happens. And if nothing's happening, why should you spend money on it? But it's the failure to spend money that causes things to happen and prevention to fail. And that really, that goes, I think, to a question that what you just said goes to a question that another member of the audience has asked, which is what do you feel is the role of government and public health in preventing and mitigating uh, future pandemics? And it sounds like your short answer would be spend more money. Oh, and make it a priority. It's not just money, right? It's, as you, is obviously it's, it's, it's a resource starved part of government and you, you hit it exactly right. When they do their job, it just looks like a cost because they're preventing things from happening all the time. Um, so that needs the, the public health elements of whether it's our, in, in Canada, it's our provinces or our local uh, uh, regional public health units or our federal public health units. They need respect and, and, and to understand just how important their roles are. I think we've all discovered how important the role of public health is, right? None of us want to be in this situation that we're in. Um, and it doesn't mean that if, if, it doesn't mean that they can prevent everything. What it does mean is that they can get us prepared for it for the worst case scenarios and, and stomp out all the little fires that are happening all the time. In fact, they, they do, and they do a remarkable job as it is with no recognition and uh, uh, a tremendous amount of, of, these are like the unsung heroes of the medical field, right? They're not, no one's making a TV show about the, <laughs> the, the public health um, folks. It's uh, the surgeons or the ER folks, but nothing, but not these guys. So that actually leads directly to a question that another member of the audience has asked, um, which is about the role of communication. And what this person asked is, what is the role of scientists and science communicators, I guess that means me, um, in, uh, in, in alerting the, the public to, the, to, to public health risks? And particularly, how should, how should we address the question of conflicting advice or of the public being uninterested or skeptical of the message. Do you have thoughts about this? Yeah, this is such an important um, aspect of what we're living through right now. And it's one of the heartbreaking things of, of the whole situation. So we as scientists are, to, are severely to blame for a lot of these problems, right? We don't value communication outside of our peer group many times. We don't get rewarded for it, certainly in academia. You don't get a pat on the back in, along the tenure process, if you know you have a very strong SciComm element to your uh, to your mm. program, um, thankfully I think those things are changing as as younger people are coming through and are realizing the importance of this. But traditionally it hasn't been. So we're not good. We're nor nor are we trained to talk to um, to people and to explain things uh, very complex things very easily, um, and. Um, and I think it's just an enormous gap, right? So people doubt experts when they have conflicting um, issues. And in science, we're used to con conflict always, right? We send our stuff, or we send our findings out for peer review. It all gets ripped apart. We're angry about it, but then that oftentimes that improves and improves things. Um, so we're used to living with these contradictions all the time. The public is not. And how we manage that, I think, is really where we have to get help from folks like you. I mean, you've done such an incredible job over the years of explaining very complex issues to the public in a number of different uh, areas. And, you know, I think going forward, we need to really embed 
folks like you and, and, and others into programs like, like ours so that we can really have this transition between it. And the, you need to teach us how to do this right. Um, so uh, there's another question that I think is directly for me, which is how are the media doing in educating around this? And, you know, I mean, this is, just as coronavirus has been hard for, for everyone in the scientific realm, it's also been hard for the media uh, because coronavirus is the only story in the world right now, which means that many, many people are covering all the unfolding scientific and, um, and public health aspects of this who have no scientific or public health expertise because they were formerly sports reporters or education reporters or law enforcement reporters. And all of those things have now gotten wrapped up in the, the larger story of coronavirus, which means that, uh, that people don't have the, people who are now functioning as coronavirus or as science reporters don't have the background of understanding how science works, um, persuading scientists to walk, have the courage to walk outside the, the language of their profession and speak everyday English. Uh, it's, it's really, a, I have found it's really a challenge for the media, the vastly expanded scientific media right now to, uh, to be able to rise to the challenge of as hard as everyone is trying. So let us skitter safely away, skitter away to the safe <laughs> territory of science then. Um, so, so much of the effort in so many countries right now has to do with treatments and vaccines. Um, you are yourself a drug discoverer. What do you think about the status of those efforts globally? Are, is there too much confidence? Um, are, do, is it reasonable to think we'll have treatments or vaccines? What, are are two more things being promised than can be delivered? What do you think? I, I, there's definitely gonna be solutions to this problem. Right, we are not doomed to dealing to having this this uh, coronavirus challenge for the remaining decade. It might be with us in pockets around the world because it's going to be hard to eradicate something like this. So it's with us. But um, I am very confident that we're going to have therapies and treatments. We have a great preventive medicine uh, measure right now, which is masks. Masks are actually quite remarkably effective at decreasing the rate of spread, which is what we want to do. Um, so all of these interventions, these are easy interventions, very low cost interventions that we're having, di social distancing. We did that really quickly and, and then masks. So while we're getting the drugs and vaccines and we will get them, I'm very confident that we're gonna get them. We need to, we need to have everyone pull their weight and do these sort of minimal things because they work. Just like, um, you know, we're hope we've, we've seen a lot of drug trials, for example, and uh, a lot of controversy about people, about drugs that come to market or, or that have been repurposed for this with, without effect. Hydroxychloroquine is a good example, right? There's lots of hype and lots of, lots of hope because no one, everyone wants a magic bullet, um, but they need to be tested and they need to be tested very, very carefully because of, and that takes time. If there was a magic bullet that had already existed in somebody's drawer, we would have it by now. Right. Every drug company on the planet has taken every old compound that they or every old drug that they had taken through the clinical trials for something else and run it against this virus because that would be the fastest way to get a drug. And we do not have a drug with the exception of a few um, therapies for, for very sick people. So the magic bullet may be out there, but it's going to take time. It took, let's remember, it took about a decade to get um, a really effective HIV cocktail to actually suppress the virus so that people could live with it. It takes a long time to do this. Um, we're, everything is going fast, just like we started this discussion in the coronavirus, it's not gonna take 10 years, trust me. It's gonna be much faster than that because whoever finds the magic bullet or something equivalent, right, is going to be the hero of the world. And so that's gonna happen. So I think that's really important. We need drugs. The vaccines are also gonna happen. Whether or not they're gonna be as effective as everyone wants them to be, nobody knows, right? Nobody, we don't have an HIV vaccine. We don't, uh, we don't have a vaccine for any other coronavirus out there. And there's been attempts to do so. I'm not saying it's not possible. And I think we will probably get some kind of vaccine, but it may not give the magical protection that everyone thinks it is. So I think we need to temper expectations we're going to have those, we're going to have vaccines, we're going to have drugs, 
it's not going to be tomorrow. And in the meantime, the stuff that does work, which is the stuff that we just did, the low tech um, stuff that we just talked about is something we all have to do. Otherwise, you know, it could get out of hand again and no one wants to see that. Right. The, the lure of technological optimism is always strong, isn't it? That the, the shiny newness will save us and not the things that we've always known to do. So, um, it. It, yeah, I mean, go things, ahead. Yeah. sorry, I mean, I'm just going to say, so one of the things that, that the people are, are, are jumping on is artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is going to solve this problem. And I'm sure artificial intelligence is going to have a role to play as a technique to make drugs and to make vaccines but it's not gonna solve this problem, right? It's the shiny, exactly what you said, it's the shiny new stuff that people think and they're gonna throw all their, their uh, expectations into this saving uh, technology. Um, and I'm sure that it's gonna have, have a role, but it's not gonna save them, right? It's, it's uh, just, I'm, I'm like everyone else. I wish it was gone and I wish we had a magic solution right away. We're just gonna have to be patient and all the, and all of the all of the work that we've done for the last century to show how to do things safely is what we have to follow. And that's the, the other concern is that, is that as as we get close to solutions, there's just there's always a temptation to go too fast. And I think it's just so dangerous for the public at large. I mean, the worst thing that we want is to cause harm. Um, and so we just have to be patient. So, you know, here in the U.S., we've been going back over the history of the 1976 swine flu, um, which was a, what, you know, a, what was thought to be a pandemic for its first three or four cases and caused a massive um, vaccination campaign to be ginned up that uh, turned out, for which it, tur it turned out there was no pandemic, but there were 45 million vaccines doses administered and there was a side effect that only appears when you deliver things in the millions of doses. And so that has really, um, there were, I think there were very conflicting impulses right now between the politicization of the vaccine search that is causing people to really want to move fast and break things and look good. And the sort of old public health hands who remember some of the things that happen when you move too fast. Absolutely, yeah. I'm, I'm curious what, um, what you think at this point about the possibilities of looking forward to, 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 to change our surveillance systems, to, to make it more likely to detect things the next time. You know, here in the US, I think it was just today, was the inaugural meeting of a network that the National Institutes of Health has funded, um, which is the uh, Centers for Research in Emerging Infection, blah, blah, blah. There's 11 centers around the United States and they have international partners and they're all going to hope to you know, create a surveillance system that we don't currently have. Uh, and the hope is that maybe there will be boots on the ground uh, or, or local relationships in different countries that don't currently exist. Do you see, um, I, where do you see the possibilities for improving surveillance for for getting further out in front of things like this? And would it ever really be possible to get really far out to detect the first spillover, to, to know that something's coming almost as soon as it happens? So I'm so here's where I think technology is gonna help us because everyone's got a cell phone and around the globe, everyone's got a cell phone. So I do think that there's gonna be ways that, that we're gonna be able to, so we found, we got to, um, Got to the virus and from the initial cases to the virus in maybe a couple of months or weeks, uh, depending on who you believe when the first cases happened in, in Wuhan area, uh, which is insanely rapid. But I could easily see us do this even more quickly um, using things like cell phone technology. And, and as that gets, we have this little app now in Ontario, it's called this co the COVID app that allows us to completely anonymously be a, um, have our phones talk to each other. And let us, and, and, and it lets um, let you know if you've been exposed to someone who eventually tests positive. Um, there's no big brother chasing you or anything like that. This is all just, you know, ones and zeros and blocks, and, and it's and it's it's really super cool. So I can imagine pushing us into into this direction. My to get to the first part of your your question though is or your comment, which is you know we're seeing a renewed interest in this. We're bringing these networks of things together. McMaster has a 
has a, a, an initiative that we want to be part of as well, and we're and we're really excited about it. Um, I'm I remember when first SARS uh, hit Ontario, and it hit us, you know, on, uh, dis, uh, disproportionately hard. It ruined the economy of Toronto for at least a couple of years, um, and um, we out of that that experience, we created the Public Health Agency of Canada, which never existed before. We created Ontario Public Health, an agency that didn't exist before. And those were exciting and new, and, and we were invested in robustly for the first few years, and people forgot, right? And, you know, they're still being funded. There's still great people working there, but the the role that public health plays, this gets back to our, one of our first, first questions, you know, it's just natural for other things to be, you know, for us to be concerned about other things rather than epidemic diseases. The opioid crisis, a great example. Um, you have to deal with these things, but you can't forget about you're retaining this investment. So my hope is, I think the world has changed. There's going to be enough collective memory that we're not going to get stuck like this in, in perpetuity. But I just wonder how long it's going to last. So our moderator elves are telling me that I only get to ask you one more question and then I have to wrap up. So um, to, to rise up a bit out of the, the, the technologically granular where we've been, uh, I think what I really want to know at a sort of, to, to elevate you to the sort of 30,000 foot level is at this point, nine months into the pandemic, you know, uh, millions of cases around the globe. Granted, things are going much better on your side of the border than on mine. Um, how, how do you feel? But where, where, where do you think we are? Uh, and, and what's our path out of this? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I, I, I'm encouraged that, uh, so I don't, I don't I'm, I'm actually very optimistic. I'm disappointed like everyone else is that this, we weren't able to quickly repurpose a drug or uh, that would that would uh, at least um, give us a therapy right away, um, but I'm really I'm you know I've seen my colleagues around the world come together in a way that that I've never seen before, all with single purpose to try and do something. People turn their labs over, uh, you know, really rapidly who were experts in other areas but had technologies or had had strategies that could be applied to this. Um, we're ramping up testing like we like we haven't seen before even though and there's going to be some hiccups and there's going to be some challenges going forward but i'm actually very uh i'm very uh optimistic about the future the, the near future uh, not so much i think we're, we're in the middle of this and it's going to be a challenge we're going to have to just understand that that's that, that it is but i do think that this is this is at the end of the day while we're this is misery for every for a lot of people we will look back on this and say that it's actually been a triumph science and technology. Um, and I hope it's gonna be a triumph in, in society as well, as we understand who are, who are the weakest people, how do we take care of them? You know, how do we make sure that this doesn't happen again? How do we reach out to our neighbors to make sure that, that they are uh, not lonely and isolated? This has been an isolating experience for all of us. Um, so if we, if, if we can learn anything from this, it's that is that investment in technology and investment in science is, is, is a really strong thing, but also investment in society is really, really important, taking care of each other. So let's hope that that's gonna happen as we, go, as we move forward through this. I cannot think of a better uh, sentiment to end on. So thank you very much. Thanks for uh, allowing me the opportunity to interrogate you about these issues. I appreciate it. And uh, audience, I hope you enjoyed this. Um, you can find out more about Dr. Wright and about the, the work that his institutes and that McMaster do um, on the, the all the various websites that I'm sure are linked from your view of this. Um, that will be it from us. Thank you so much. Stay safe. Bye. Thank you.